My name is Brad Woodberg. Uh, this is a talk about network application firewalls. Um, I'm with Juniper Networks. I'm a uh, security engineer on the high-end SRX product team. Um, but first, let me uh, thank you all for coming out, uh, especially on this Sunday matinee afternoon. Uh, sorry if I have a little bit of a Vegas accent because it's been, uh, been a long con, but it's been awesome. So once again, thank you very much for coming. So what we're going to talk a little bit about here is we're going to start with what exactly network application firewalls are. We're going to go into some uh, description of, you know, basically what they can and can't do, vulnerabilities, and kind of deploying them right. Uh, one thing that I've noticed when it comes to network application firewalls, uh, many vendors have them now. It's really something that's, uh, you know, kind of really picking up steam. A lot of products are integrating it, but very few, if Really, I, I haven't heard really any explanation uh, from, you know, the different documentation, marketing literature, whatever, of what these actually do, how they function more importantly, and what potential vulnerabilities they have. And I think that that makes a really big uh, difference uh, and is very important to understand what, what the limitations are, and that really hasn't been uh, discussed. Uh, so basically, kind of the key issues that you can think about when we're going through of the talk is basically that these new network application firewalls, they're not going to change anything in terms of the need for traditional uh, layer 3, layer 4 stateful firewalls and IPS. Um, basically, there's limitations both in the technology and also there's uh, certain uh, uh, spe uh, vendor specific implementation limitations uh, that, that they could have. So, you know, if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're looking at deploying this technology, it's definitely something that you want to check out, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, that, that they're not cutting any corners. And basically, going to just talk uh, briefly at the end just about getting it right uh, so that you guys can actually uh, take away and have some practical knowledge uh, for this. So basically, let's talk about the evolution of kind of network security. First, we had stateless packet filters, uh, known as ACLs, or accessless. Uh, these were uh, kind of some of the first generation of, uh, of, you know, kind of access control on networks uh, when it came to the actual network layer. Uh, they were traditionally implemented at routers, and also they could be done on switches as well. Um, but they were quite limited. I mean, they, they could function very fast. They could be done in hardware. Uh, but uh, but they were quite limited. Uh, they didn't have any other knowledge. They didn't take the bigger picture of a connection into mind when it came to uh, the actual packet processing. It was just, does this individual packet match these characteristics, and do I permit or deny it? So that had a lot of limitations, especially in the early days when uh, when there was uh, many vulnerabilities being discovered in the actual TCP/IP network stacks. So then we got stateful firewall, and that tried to assist uh, to, to, first off, fully categorize a connection uh, into, uh, you know, in, in a flow or a session. Um, that also uh, gave us more capabilities when it came to net network address translation as well. Um, and it also took into account the statefulness of the actual layer, uh, layer four protocol. Uh, so like TCP, uh, you couldn't just uh, spoof flags and pass those through. You actually had to have a full connection. It was set up and it was torn down. Then we got full IPS, um, or well, originally it was IDS, but uh, we got full IPS, and basically that took a lot of the limitations when it came to stateful firewalling into account because part of the issue with stateful firewalling is while it did do a good job of restricting actual traffic, it didn't do anything to be able to block uh, exploits, be able to look deeper into uh, the flows and determine, you know, what the actual application behavior was and so forth. So we got full IPS to basically uh, handle the limitations of stateful firewalls and access lists. And now we have application firewalls. And you'll see, um, it, it, and, and this will be part of the talk, uh, they cover a lot less than what uh, full uh, stateful, uh, I'm sorry, what full IPS did. But we'll, we'll see a little bit more of that. So really, what's new here? What, what what's kind of differentiates uh, this, this uh, uh, network application technology? And again, don't think that it's not necessarily that it's a separate box. A lot of it is just integrated into uh, some of the current generations of, of firewall products. But what's new? 
Uh, first off, uh, we have something called App ID. Now, actually, App ID isn't new at all, um, but the application of it uh, into a firewall uh, is is slightly new. And basically, what it's going to do is it's going to actually look deeper into the actual connection itself. It's not just going to stop at the layer three, layer four level of inspection. It's actually going to look a little bit further to determine what the actual application is itself. Um, as I mentioned, App ID, its purpose is to detect applications, not exploits. Um, and really, it's been around for uh, quite a while. I mean, it's been used in, uh, in uh, traditional IPS products so that they could do port agnostic detection. Uh, so you could, you know, have HTTP running over port, you know, you know, 493 or any port, and it would still be able to apply the detection. Uh, t uh, basically, the, the protocol decoders and the parsers could still be applied uh, regardless of what port it was on. So, and this technology was also, has been used for like URL filtering and uh, in network AV products as well. So it's not anything that's new, uh, but it's something that's been extended and, uh, and put into uh, kind of an, a new application. So in terms of how App ID does pattern matching, uh, there's a, you know, a, there's different algorithms and we're not going to go into those uh, in, in much detail. A lot of it is really the same uh, types of, uh, of pattern uh, matching techniques that have been used in uh, traditional uh, IPS products and also, as I mentioned, you know, different layer seven service products uh, like URL filtering and AV. Um, basically, uh, what typically has to happen is first the firewall is going to premiere deny the traffic, there's some pre-processing, which we're going to go into in more detail, and then we actually do the pattern matching. Um, there's different string ma matching algorithms like uh, Boy Moore, uh, Aho Krasik, and uh, Ribbon Carp. Um, there's DFA-based uh, state machine matching, and then of course there's also hardware, which is being leveraged more and more to actually do the, the pattern matching. Now there's one thing that I wanted to call out uh, when it comes to the actual application matching is, is kind of an interesting new topic, uh, which is uh, nested application detection. Because if you think about it, nowadays HTTP is almost like the new TCP in a way. Um, most al uh, most applications that are being developed are being given w are being developed on web interfaces, um, and there's several reasons for that. Of course, I mean you guys know uh, most clients have web browsers. The server technology is freely available and is very mature. Works great. Um, there's lots of toolkits and underlying technology, especially with things like uh, you know JavaScript and all the HTML5 and everything to really give the applications more color. So they've been developing more and more applications on top of HTTP, and HTTP is just an example of, a nested, of what a nested application could be. So if we just stopped at the real application level at layer seven, we said this is HTTP, we wouldn't know what the actual, you know, we, we'd be pretty limited, because obviously there's different applications like YouTube or Pandora that folks might not want versus Outlook or, you know, Google Docs or something like that. So uh, keep in mind that there's also the concept of taking it to another level with uh, nested applications. Now I just wanted to show what uh, an example of an app ID signature may be. Uh, basically, these are pretty similar to, um, to IPS signatures, as I mentioned. Uh, we have both a layer seven application and also a nested application. So looking on the left side, uh, basically we're looking for a DFA pattern, um, and we're doing so in both directions in this specific implementation. That's really actually quite important, uh, as you'll see later. If you only look in one direction, uh, which I've seen uh, vendors do, um, different implementations do, typically for performance, you're basically, you, there's, there's a good chance that you could be uh, uh, pretty easily evaded, and I'll go into some more details on what that could look like. Um, so basically, we're looking for specific patterns in the client to server direction and the server to client direction. Um, in the case of the layer seven uh, match, basically, we've already identified what the, the parent application, in most cases it's HTTP, it could be other uh, applications as well, and then we identify, we're looking for more information once we've actually identified the parent protocol. So we're looking, in this case, we're looking at, uh, looking for Facebook, we're checking the header host information and the URL, in this case, uh, to be able to identify that this is Facebook running on top of HTTP uh, rather than, you know, something else. 
Now, what's really critical to understand, uh, in addition to just the underlying technology itself, is that App ID is being used to feed a lot of different technologies uh, that are being integrated into these firewalls. So, for instance, uh, the information that's gleaned from App ID can be used for application firewalling, which is kind of the core thing here, whether we permit or deny the applications. It can be leveraged by the IPS engine for, you know, if it's, uh, you know, for detecting what uh, applications running so it knows what type of inspection to do, antivirus, URL filtering, different applications, QoS, there's a lot of things that are relying on the uh, information being gleaned from the App ID engine uh, to be able to make effective decisions. And because of that, that also means that if you can potentially trick the App ID engine, uh, then you can potentially bypass these other Layer 7 services as well. Uh, one relatively new uh, uh, technique is called application caching, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the limitations of it. Um, basically, doing App ID is expensive, or at least it's a lot more expensive than doing just your traditional layer 3, layer 4 forwarding, stateful firewall. Not as expensive as IPS, uh, but Typically, uh, you know, you, you still are going to have to do a lot of pre-processing, and then you have to do the pattern matching. Um, and in the case of good applications, uh, you know, what's going to happen is typically if you go to a web server on, you know, TCP port 80, it's it shouldn't be changing applications anytime. It should be HTTP every time. That really shouldn't be changing. So uh, sometimes uh, application caching is turned on. It's not that it's a bad thing, but it's an important thing to understand the limitations. Uh, because basically, if you're doing application caching, it's something that a uh, you know a, a malicious attacker could potentially leverage. And when I was writing the presentation, I was watching Alien, so I was really hyped up, so put some uh, some aliens quotes in there. So let's talk about the pre-processing. You know, we, we've already discussed uh, kind of a high level of what the actual application identification is. It's doing the pattern matching. But before we can actually do any pattern matching, we, we there's quite a bit of pre-processing that, pre -processing that has to be done. Um, and this is a, you know, if you guys are doing any kind of evaluations or you're checking out this technology, this is a really, really important point to think about. Um, uh, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, especially in some older uh, routing code uh, where they were doing uh, pattern matching, they were doing no pre-processing. So, you know, if you just fragmented the traffic or, you know, used TCP segments or any kind of evasion, um, it wouldn't detect the application because it was just doing a simple dumb pattern match on the actual application uh, traffic. So it was just looking for HTTP. And, and here's an example. Um, you know, basically, if, if, you know, just in the case of fragmentation, if you were looking for, let's say, uh, get an HTTP as the pattern for the application, if it was just in a single packet, that could be fine. Uh, but basically, if you did, uh, you know, any kind of fragmentation, if it was looking for that pattern of git, you know, a, you know, the HTTP and the git in an individual packet and it didn't reassemble it, then you'd be able to b pass this right through. The hosts on either side obviously will handle the, the uh, fragmentation just fine and they'll reassemble it and you can potentially get the, the traffic through. So just basically you have to do all the same things that a host is going to do uh, to ensure the, you know, the fidelity of the traffic or any kind of reassembly is going to be quite important. Ordering is actually going to be uh, another thing as well, um, because kind of for the same issues uh, with with the case of, uh, of of fragmentation. Naturally, packets can get out of order. Um, that's you know well known, and uh, and th also an attacker could try to use this to their uh, benefit as well. So if you don't match the packets in order and you don't reassemble, then you can potentially uh, get stuff by as well. So again, this is kind of why doing the actual app ID is more expensive than doing just simple firewalling because you ha there's a lot more that has to go in it, more memory required to hold on to the packets and the stream for the entire window, et cetera. And of course, uh, you know, doing the, the proper reassembly um, is, is also critical. Uh, 
all the same evasions that we've seen for uh, IPSs with TCP segment overlaps and underlaps and fragmentation, it all you know is it all has to do with the same uh, same stuff. So uh, when it comes to application firewalling, so in this example here, if you were to send uh, two uh, seg you know segment threes and one was HTTP, one was SIP, how is the app ID engine going to know which one? You know, if you if you want to um, you know to allow HTTP uh, but deny everything else. Uh, uh, you know, potentially you could get sipped through by also just kind of piggybacking that, that packet at the same time if the pre-processing wasn't being done properly. And of course, our friend the Ghostbusters, uh, they got it right too. Can't cross the stream, so. So what we're going to actually do is we're going to dig into some examples now uh, and look at this in kind of practical uh, real world uh, application. So one thing that I didn't really emphasize yet, but that's really important uh, to, to, well, I guess I subtly implied it, but it's really important, is unlike firewalls, which know exactly what decision to make on that very first packet, right? They know if it's going to be denied or permitted. Uh, network application firewall may not. I mean, obviously, you can still have the same layer three, layer four stateful uh, inspection, and, and it can do, uh, you know, basically, you can make decisions at the layer three, layer four level, but if that traffic is permitted, and let's say you want to allow HTTP through, but you want to block SMTP or something else, you won't know until at least the, th I mean, really, it can't, it's not even the third packets, it's, it's actually beyond that, uh, what, what this application is. So the important thing to take away uh, is that you do have to let some traffic through, because otherwise the network application firewall is just, it's not going to know, uh, certainly not on the first packet. And so looking at the flow table here um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, next gen firewall, basically what we can see here is that the application is unknown, uh, which is zero. You'll see it'll make more sense uh, in the future. But we've already sent three packets that have gone back and forth. Then, of course, once we send, uh, you know, the actual application traffic, then that's when we can identify what this application is. In this case, it's just web browsing. But as I pointed to earlier, network application firewalls aren't going to do anything in, you know, network uh, application firewalling isn't going to do anything to protect you against any kind of layer seven exploits. So in this case, uh, just throwing a, you know, a nice old uh, a vulnerability to execute, uh, you know, command exe on a, on a IIS server um, went through just fine because, of course, you know, it identified it as the proper network application, um, you know, which is web browsing, but it was a malicious threat. And, of course, the network application isn't looking for that. It's just trying to identify what application it is. So let's kind of go into a little bit more detail here and discuss some of the specific threats, some things that I've tested. And um, the first one is kind of uh, the fact that network application firewalls in and of themselves are only typically looking at a few hundred to a few thousand bytes in either direction. So it's not going to be inspecting the whole uh, flow, uh, at least none of the ones that I've seen um, uh, actually will inspect the entire flow. They're just going to inspect a small portion. And of course the reason for that is because uh, performance and, you know, Typically, an application ought not to change, but as an attacker, uh, you could you could potentially do that. Now, what's the likelihood of client and server collusion? Actually, it's a lot higher than you might think, just kind of offhand, uh, because we'll kind of uh, just a few examples, right? Um, obviously, there's a lot of new applications that are trying to be evasive. Take like peer to peer. The client and the server can collude. They have they're speaking the same uh, uh, protocol. They you know can coordinate the message. Obviously, if you are a client and there's a server that you don't control out there, then you know it, you can't just talk HTTP to you know say FTP or something like that. That won't work. But if the client and the server are going to be speaking the same application protocol, then that's perfectly fine. And I really expect to see a lot more of this uh, with both applications and also with malware as well, because as malware you know understands. Uh, really what, what, what's going, you know, the, the creators of malware understand what's going on with these uh, types of filtering. Uh, they'll start to uh, leverage the same type of collusion. Start the application connection as something and switch it over. So in this example, um, I, I just wrote a really simple program to do it, um, but you can use like Scapy or, you know, write your own little script. Uh, I started the actual application as HTTP and I just flipped it uh, mid, uh, you know, mid, mid uh, stream. Uh, to start talking FTP, I'm sorry, SMTP, uh, after the initial uh, identification had occurred. 
And of course, because we're only looking in network application, firewalls are typically only looking at a few hundred to a few thousand bytes. Uh, once you're past that, that threshold, then you know, you're home free. If there isn't another mechanism to restrict that, uh, and, and we'll kind of uh, discuss that uh, shortly. Now, in this, in this particular, um, uh, th this vendor had this vulnerability uh, before and they, they actually fixed it. Um, but basically they were only looking at the time at one direction of the traffic. So basically, and it was the client to the server. And that presents issues for a few different reasons. I mean, first off, uh, accuracy issues because, you know, a lot of times you need to look at the server to client response to be able to make a good guess. I mean, you know, FTP and SMTP actually look really, really similar as it turns out. And uh, if you're not looking at both directions, it can be very hard to tell the difference, um, especially if they've, you know, this Especially depending on uh, you know the the implementation, uh, the different uh, of different SMTP and, uh, and FTP servers. So actually checking for both bidirectional uh, inspection is going to be really important. In this example, what I did was I just sent you know uh, a GET request to uh, to an FTP server. And not all applications, remember, will actually if you let's say you only were looking at the client to server. FTP, SMTP, other applications as well may not close down that connection, right? So if you sent a GET, you know, the FTP server is going to say, well, I don't know, that's, you know, bad message. But if, if all the network application firewall did was look at that client to server direction, then it would say, oh, well, it's, an, it's HTTP, but really it could be something else. And then they could just do an FTP file transfer right after, you know, without, without any issues. So, of course, if you're not looking at things bidirectionally, that can create a, uh, certainly create an issue for you. Um, also, what happens if you reverse the direction? Again, this is this is more of an evasion, right? Um, but and, and not something that a normal application would do. Um, but something that I did have some luck um, on on some different network application firewall implementations, where basically I sent the same application, but I reversed the client to server and the server to client to kind of see are they matching, are they looking in both directions, and more specifically, not only are they looking in both directions, but are they specifically looking for the patterns that should be in the client to server direction, in the client to server direction, or are they just saying, hey, match any of these and look in both directions? Uh, again, that's something that I saw, uh, especially on some earlier routing code. Um, it really didn't, uh, uh, re they really weren't checking the directions properly. They were just looking in one direction or the other, but the patterns weren't differentiated. In some cases, uh, you know, certainly noticed uh, some port-based detection being used. So basically, you could send the exact same pattern over a different port, and it would be, you know, it would be uh, not detected. In this case, I sent uh, DNS over what port was it? Uh, over port 80 or something, and uh, you know, versus port 53 it was the exact same traffic, but it was detected as as being unknown. Now, this isn't necessarily a vulnerability um, because in some cases, as I mentioned, this is done a little bit more for accuracy. Like, like DNS is probably an extreme example because you really ought never to see it on any port besides 53 or 5353. Um, but it certainly is possible and, uh, and, and, and you know, if you're evaluating or you're looking at this technology, making sure that it isn't just doing the inspection based upon the port um, can be very important because what, what could potentially be happening is, yeah, they're looking for DNS on port 53, um, but that may be the only place that they're looking for it. And, uh, and if you're, you know, allowing something else out, it could be an issue. And of course, uh, you know, uh, one other thing to mention, um, you know, in the case of like, you know, uh, DNS tunneling, you know, so something that, you know, our friend Dan Kaminsky has covered uh, in great detail as, as of others, um, of course, that would just be detected as DNS in the case of, uh, of simple network application firewall, because that's what it is. It wouldn't necessarily say, hey, there's like 10 gigs of traffic being transmitted over here. You know, it might be something kind of weird. It's just going to be DNS, and it'll, it'll be perfectly happy with that. So I mentioned about application caching. Um, and it's, again, it's not that application caching is a bad thing at all. Um, and depending on how you're deploying this, it could be perfectly legitimate. Like if you're deploying this in front of a data center that you control to like, you know, accept inbound connections, um, typically if you're controlling the actual servers, then it shouldn't be a big deal. Doing application caching can be used for performance. Um, and also in, in some uh, other uses of the actual app ID information, let's say like application routing. So making routing decisions uh, let's say to like send the traffic through a proxy or something like that, um, 
that would really need to use caching because you wouldn't be able to know, again, ahead of time what it's going to be unless if you've already seen the traffic. So stuff like application routing and QoS and stuff like that um, could really, you know, leverage the application caching, but there is a limitation and potential vulnerability. So in this example, what I've done um, is uh, I just configured the firewall to look for, uh, you know, SMTP on any port and drop it, uh, no matter what, and uh, allow everything else. So just kind of, you know, testing, you know, smoke test here. Uh, I just send uh, SMTP and it gets detected properly. This is uh, looking at the logging message. Uh, we see that it's SMTP, we drop it, exactly what we'd expect. And what, what happens, um, in, or what we're going to do now is we're going to actually poison the cache um, to be able to insert the application in the cache table uh, and see what happens. So in this case, I just sent a bunch of, uh, you know, HTTP messages. I just, you know, used, uh, again, this just simple program I whipped up, but you could use wget or really anything um, as long as, you know, the client and the server can uh, properly collude. So basically I just send a bunch of uh, HTTP messages and, it, and you can see that it puts a entry in the application cache. Uh, protocol 6 is obviously TCP, uh, port 80, and it cached it as application ID 109, which stands for, uh, you know, web browsing in this case, HTTP. And so now, whereas before I couldn't send my SMTP traffic through, uh, I can. I work just fine. Uh, and the reason why is because it identified that traffic, you know, on port 80, TCP port 80 on, uh, on, on the uh, server, which is 192.168.2.13. Anything that goes over there until this cache entry times out is going to be considered HTTP, even though it isn't. And we can see here now that we're getting cache hits every time that we, um, so, so the count is, is the threshold of how many uh, they need to see before they actually put a entry in the app cache. The hits is how many that we're getting now is, uh, you know, which is saying, yes, this is a cache hit, it matches, but in reality we're sending SMTP, not, not HTTP. And that's exactly what the logs, uh, the logs say, that this is all web browsing when in fact it's not. Now obviously there's security implications for that, but the other thing as well to think about is a lot of folks are using this uh, for logging and reporting and trying to understand volumes of, of traffic and metrics. So even if something malicious wasn't going on here, you might potentially, you know, get these reports that the information is completely inaccurate because it hasn't, you know, properly, it's not matching the real application. So sometimes it can be more than just a security thing as well. Now, caching of Nest applications is something that I've been actually quite interested in, um, and it's really kind of a bad idea if you think about it, because first off, a lot of servers take like a web server doing virtual hosts, um, unless if the actual application ID engine is smart enough to, to, to look and understand, you know, what host it's going to, um, then if you cached, you know, a potentially like a Google video, it could, there could be another, you know, Google Plus potentially hosted on the exact same server. Um, and uh, that could be both something done maliciously or it could be something, you know, perfectly legitimately done, it's very common. Um, and basically if you cache nested applications and you have to go back and check for the actual cache hits, you're already doing most of the work anyway. So there's really no point in most cases of doing the, the nested application caching because it kind of can, you know, just really limit you on, on your detection. Now a really interesting thing uh, has come up uh, which we've noticed and, you know, Different implementations are going to handle this differently, but it's called conflict resolution. Um, and this is something that an attacker might be able to do. Um, but what happens if you have uh, an application that looks, uh, you know, that, that matches more than one application, right? So it could potentially match, like, you know, SMTP and FTP are very similar. They could potentially match each other's. Which, how do you resolve conflicts in the actual application detection? Um, and that could be used potentially to an attacker's uh, benefit. Um, and it'll really just vary by implementation. A lot will just do port, you know, they'll kind of fall back on the port and say, hey, if it, you know, if we detected this pattern, we expect this, um, you know, there's kind of like a default port that w we'd say, okay, well, this is just, this must be HTTP. Um, some will just list it as an unknown application or others will, you know, could, you know, might, might just pick one of the two in order of precedence, in order of, of, of the likelihood. So a conflict resolution is, is potentially something that, that could be leveraged uh, to, you know, for, for both uh, good and bad. <laughs>
Now, I've also been doing like a little bit of research, and this is something that, that I just kind of crammed in here this week, so sorry for the slides a little bit busy. Um, but application layer gateways, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, these are something that have been around in uh, firewalls for a long time. And basically what they're used to do is to, they, they actually do have to, they look at layer seven, take it FTP in this example, looking at the control channel to see what port is gonna be dynamically negotiated for the data channel. Um, and the really interesting thing about application layer gateways and how they could potentially interact uh, is that how do you classify the data channel, right? Uh, in the case of uh, FTP, it can just be a binary stream. So if you actually, I did a test um, and, and I sent just a PCAP, right? And, you know, and, and it actually detected the data channel as HTTP uh, because obviously it hadn't coordinated that. Because being a PCAP, I mean, obviously there's the, the per packet headers, but if it's just doing some blind pattern matching, then it's just gonna identify that as, uh, you know, as, as HTTP just fine without actually thinking that, hey, this could be a PCAP. Um, so application layer gateways, uh, especially when it comes to the auxiliary channel, the data channel, um, can have interesting impacts on the actual flow of traffic and application identification. What I've noticed is some do a good job and they will actually, you know, have the intelligence to mark the session, the auxiliary session, as being part of the parent session, but some may not. It's kind of, you know, your mileage may vary. So if you're, you know, if you're doing, you know, some sort of testing or something, you might want to look at that um, to, to kind of see. And like I said, the easy way to do that uh, is, is really just to, you know, but you, you know, send a PCAP as the, uh, as, as the auxiliary uh, traffic and see what happens if it picks it up as, say, HTTP or something else in the PCAP or if it's actually smart enough to identify it by the application that it really is. So what do we do about applications that we don't know? Um, and this is this is uh, and this 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 is probably one of my one of my favorite things uh, when it came to, to checking out this vendor. Um, is you know what happens if you don't know an application, and this ha this will happen all the time, right? Um, and it's not just that you can always block unknown applications. It's kind of like you know protocol anomalies in IPS. You know a lot of applications are written very poor, so it could be just that you know it's not following the RFCs or the standards uh, of the applications. Applications change all the time. You have new versions, and you know so so it's not really uncommon. And uh, and also you may just not have an actual application uh, signature or detection for that application, so it could be unknown. So what I did here was, uh, and we're just gonna kind of walk you through what I noticed this particular uh, vendor was doing. Um, and, uh, and so basically I just sent some unknown traffic. Um, you know, here's just looking, I haven't sent anything layer seven yet. I just opened the session, TCP. And we can actually look at the, if I, I dug into the actual session ID itself, we can see uh, that application is unknown, it's undecided, and layer seven processing is still being done uh, as far as it's concerned. Uh, just sent a few packets back and forth. So now I'm gonna send some actually, I'm gonna send uh, just a bunch of garbage, and I think I think I showed it in the next slide, uh, but just sending garbage through, right? So it's not gonna know what this actual application is. And what I noticed was a very interesting thing. You know, it marked it as unknown TCP, but I noticed that it said layer seven processing was completed. And so that means, you know, no, no IPS, no AV, no URL filtering, nothing at layer seven. But it got even better than that. Not only were they not looking at anything from layer seven, uh, they actually actually push the traffic down into the ASIC, into the, uh, you know, so out of the, the processor that's actually doing the security processing, just down into the MPU, or network processing unit. So they weren't even inspecting this at all. And I did that simply by just sending some garbage traffic. And then, of course, in that, in that session, I was not only able to do that, but I could then send exploits through. Now, of course, if you send garbage application traffic, it's gonna, you know, your mileage is gonna vary, right? Because, you know, some applications may just close down the connection, while others like FTP, SMTP, uh, you know, might just say, hey, I don't know what that is, and then, you know, you might be able to push an exploit through. But this could also be used not only for actual exploits, but it could be used simply to try to evade the application, uh, network application firewall, and, uh, and, and try to, you know, push traffic through, uh, potentially, you know, do backdoor communication, command and control, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that you could potentially leverage with a vulnerability like this. And as I mentioned, all the different systems seem to be implementing this behavior differently, but it's a great one to look at. So, the really interesting thing uh, that 
you know, looking forward and, and also looking in the past and what's happened um, is that applications, you know, you have honest applications, right? But other applications are trying to do uh, things to remain undetected. Now, maybe that's something like Tor uh, or BitTorrent or, you know, there could be perfectly good uses for this, so it's, it's not a bad thing. Um, but, uh, but in terms of what I'm seeing um, is that more applications are going to get a lot, uh, they're, they're going to go to greater lengths to remain undetected. Um, encryption can be one mechanism to do this. Um, now, it's pretty easy as it turns out to detect encrypted applications uh, because you can just measure the randomness of the uh, bytes, so it's called the data entropy. You can measure that and anything that's encrypted or compressed should be highly random. Uh, but anything that isn't uh, uh, would, you know, would, would, you know, sh ought not to be encrypted at least with anything, any kind of standard encryption or compression protocols. Um, and for that reason, I also expect that we're going to see uh, more leveraging of like steganography, because that's kind of the ultimate, uh, especially if you leverage steganography and encryption, it's kind of like the ultimate way to really uh, hide messages, because you're hiding stuff in plain sight. It works in prisons, it's worked, you know, it's been around for, you know, thousands of years, so it's, it's not anything that's particularly new, um, but it's a really strong method. And of course, tunneling applications within other applications applications uh, as well can be a method to obfuscate the traffic. It might be a legitimate use like GRE tunneling or SSL or it may be something a little bit more uh, nefarious. And I mentioned uh, just a moment ago uh, the ability to do application ID without specifically pattern matching. Um, pattern matching is good for matching, you know, easy applications and and uh, and we'll just say, you know, honest applications. Uh, but in order to match some of the more um, dynamic and, uh, and and complicated applications, you can't just leverage pattern matching for the exact same reason as with IPS. You can't just only leverage pattern matching because sometimes it won't, you know, the the pattern could actually change. Uh, dynamically within every connection and it won't be something that remains consistent. So uh, in the case of BitTorrent, there's different ways of doing that. Uh, I've actually seen some really cool things where they'll actually look at the, the messages, the distributed hash tables and try to look at the super node information that gets pulled down because once the host can start communicating encrypted, it's easy to identify that this application is encrypted but it's hard to say, hey, this is BitTorrent versus, you know, something else, uh, you know, which may be perfectly legitimate. So doing application ID uh, pattern matching, I'm sorry, app ID without pattern matching is something that, that we're definitely seeing a, a little bit more and that's kind of in response as I mentioned to these applications getting more and more complex and, uh, and, 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 and more evasive in nature. So really, what is that, what does application firewalling change? Um, and again, it's not that application firewalling is bad. It certainly is a step better than stateful firewalling but you still, it's still a subset of IPS. So it's, you can't just, you know, if you're really concerned about security, if you're only deploying a firewall before, you know, that would be an issue. Um, but, uh, you know, and, th and this can advance that to essentially keep honest applications honest, right? It's just like, you know, the locks on your door. We all know that, you know, to a normal person, they wouldn't be able to pick them, but, you know, as we see right down the hall, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of people who are qu excelled at it. Um, and it's really the same thing with applications. And, and even if you look at BitTorrent or Skype, those are examples of applications that people are using and they don't have any idea about how it's functioning under the hood. So it's not like you have to be, you know, a crafted and a very skilled attacker to be able to leverage these types of evasions. You could just be using an application that, that has been, you know, written even one that's very public and, and you know, and, and, and widely used, you could be using an application uh, that, that really leverages these evasive behaviors and maybe not, not really know about it. Application firewalling, you know, it is kind of a lightweight implementation of IPS in a way. Uh, it's basically doing the application identification, but we're not doing any of the actual exploit detection. Uh, so you still need to use full IPS if you're going to deploy this and you care about, you know, not not being hacked, or at least putting up, you know, more uh, defense in depth and, and more controls, uh, you know, to, to, to protect yourself. And really, a lot of the different network application firewalls are kind of, you know, again, as I've noticed, they've really vary in nature. They're, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's not a technology that has matured like, you know, stateful firewalling or, you know, antivirus is relatively mature. It still has limitations, but, you know, it, it's something that, that, that folks have, uh, you know, spent a lot of time on. This is a relatively new technology and the behaviors are kind of not very well defined. It's going to vary on implementation by implementation. 
Um, I already covered this, but uh, really, I expect more applications. Uh, you know, they're they're going to be uh, optimizing themselves. Like, take Speedy for instance, and I know there's been a, a few talks on that here in a, at uh, Black Hat. <clears throat> which is uh, Google's new HTTP application. You know, it can leverage both uh, SSL and built-in compression and does things a lot more intelligently. You know, I expect to see that, that applications are going to start uh, leveraging steganography and other mechanisms to really uh, make themselves uh, more evasive. Um, and that will be really tough to block. I mean, if you think about it, we'll have to really start leveraging heuristics, uh, you know, especially if folks do a good job. And it's not only applications. I expect this to happen with malware as well. That uh, you know, with botnets, they're going to start phoning home, and they probably already do a lot of this uh, to some degree. So, really, you know, what to take away, and 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 you know, what do you still need to do? Because again, I, just from the the media marketing perspective, application firewalls have been really kind of marketed as kind of a you know panacea, and uh, and. It's not that they're bad, uh, but they still need to be used in, and they still need to complement, uh, they need to be used uh, in concert with a lot of the traditional technologies that you're already deploying. You, st you know, you can't just, you don't want to open up your, uh, your firewall and, you know, just start blocking on application ports. You still want to do all the stateful firewalling. You still want to, you know, be deploying full IPS, you know, and, and looking for those exploits because the network application firewall in and of itself isn't going to do that. Um, there's certain things that may or may not be turned on and you have to look at your individual deployment whether it makes sense to do things like caching um, and, and really examining what the default behaviors and default settings are. And you know, again, uh, just kind of following a lot of the same best practices that you've already grown accustomed to. You know, don't let this, uh, this new technology kind of lower your guard because you think that it's going to be doing more, more than uh, it's actually uh, capable of doing. So uh, that's really it. Um, I'm going to be uh, in uh, the track one QA room. And uh, again, my name is Brad Woodberg. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Stuffcon's been awesome. <laughs>